and made. Oh, they weren't on top of your. So, um, Mona and I are just going to give a, a, a quick introduction and then and then hand it off to to staff to kind of you know run through the the meat here of what I think is going to be what I hope is I feel will be uh, one of our more purposeful uh, feeling like we're making progress meetings, uh, which hopefully the topic uh, gave you a strong indication of. Um, so what we're going to do is, is first we're going to just do the kind of standard quick update on the, on the process and timeline where we are on that. Then uh, staff is going to introduce the methodology for the scenario development and the framework for evaluating those scenarios. Um, you know, you probably saw when you got the packet, it was a 69 pager that was an oh no, but really it was just, you know, 11, 13 pages, whatever it was, that's sort of what we're going to be discussing. And then the waste and the, and the PR report and the energy white paper are all just sort of more meaty info and, and background that if you dug in on it, amazing. Like you, we, we should all get through it at some point, but it, uh, we won't be discussing it today. We'll jump in and get through this. That, so now we're going to have a, again, staff's going to go through the components of each of the scenarios that we have before us. I think there's five of them. And then we're going to talk about the tools that were used to comprise the scenarios. And then we want to get a free one of that feedback in the group of um, what, what, how do we, what do we think is going to be most effective? in reaching the goals that we've set and accounting listeners have set as well. And so hopefully we're going to be able to devise and establish a list of preferred tools as our foundational process here so that we can move forward to the scenario. So I think Miles is going to take it away here. So and again, thank you everybody for coming in person. I know there's a few people who couldn't make it in person and a couple people we couldn't make it at all, but thanks. That's your so thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mona and Michael. And, and it's great to see so many of you in person. Hope you all had great holidays. I think we just have one committee member, Christy Blish, virtual. Hey, Christy. And then we've got staff and some PNZ members as well. So um, we're really looking forward to summarizing what was in the memo, as, as Mona and Michael said, very quickly um, so that we can live on your request to get to some of our exercises before um, too much of the meeting passes. And uh, you all should have four things in front of you. You should have some green sticky dots with the numbers one through three. We're gonna be using those um, to dot our scenarios. You should have some red sticky dots with the numbers one through six. We're gonna use those to rank order some of our tools after we identify if any are missing. Um, there's an evaluation framework. It's a really high level matrix that's color coded by column just to use as some wayfinding. Think of it almost as a navigational tool um, as we talk through some of our, our elements tonight, just to be making notes. And then similarly, you have a table of the scenario components, also known as the tools um, that just lists them out with an empty column on the far right for committee feedback because those tools how we use them when they when we use them how far we turn the dial on them will all be up to you and i think we've got a, an extra spot right up here awesome <laughs> sorry. So, sorry if you don't have that um so i may just find alex and um uh, okay. we'll get into that sure so jumping right into Great, that's it. That's a lot tonight. This is where the Rocky Mountains is here. That maybe has, has a slight edge, but the view is nowhere near as good. <laughs> um, so, as Mona and Mike said, we want to take just a few minutes to walk through the committee process and our updated timeline and milestones. And Mavis, if we could minimize the gallery view for yes. this portion. Um, we're going to go over the methodology, the evaluation framework, and some of the, the scenario components so that you all can, can help us understand how we need to revise them. All of these scenarios you're going to see tonight could have a million different variations. This is a starting point. They're designed just to be building blocks for our conversation so we can begin to hone in on our ultimate recommendation. Um, the, the bulk of our meeting is going to be spent dotting. We're going to dot quickly, and then we're going to going to discuss and, and really start to, to move towards the end game here. We've got 
um, after tonight, I think it's six meetings, including today. So um, we're going to be getting to that suite of recommendations by looking at these scenario models, adjusting the dials, evaluating the tools and the impacts, and then getting into the refinement and the inevitable trade-offs that are going to be involved as we get towards the end of March. Um, there's a look at, including tonight, we've got um, six meetings. So we want to make the most of this time and really get into it, roll up our sleeves tonight. Um, our trajectory. This is the hourglass timeline that you all have seen before. So you can see we're we're getting into the final leg of our marathon here, where we're really beginning to package the the different tools that are out there into some of the scenarios, so that we can begin to really analyze them and look at their efficacy, their effectiveness, and look at how we can populate that that framework that you've got in front of you. Um, so we're going to just get right to it. We're going to walk through. The framework, the, the framework that you have is a simplified version of this. Um, we anticipate that the framework you saw in your packet, which was shown here, will continue to evolve as we go. I think Michael did the math. The math it has 420 cells. By, by, by a beautiful coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure that number will grow. But um, some of those cells will have a level of specificity with some numbers in them. Um, others may be a little bit higher level and just have gradations of like a red, green, yellow. Um, so we're going to be working through this, refining this framework as we go to really track the, the effectiveness of all the different tools. Um, we're starting with the scenario version that you all have in front of you that looks like this. And as I said, it's more of a navigational tool at this point because we know there was a lot in that packet. There's a lot to keep track. It's a lot for us to keep track, and this was a helpful tool for doing that. So. Um, this is all to say it's going to continue to evolve with your guidance. And so for our scenario components, what we're calling the tools, um, th these were all of the things you saw in the memo. You have them in your handout um, with the, the first vertical being the tool, the second vertical being the existing conditions, the state of where those tools are being used and the position of the dial on those tools today, and then potential areas of change as well as the empty column areas that you would like to see them change. So please be filling that out as we walk through it tonight. But there are 11 tools. Zoning is one of the big foundational tools, followed by the square footage cap, slope reduction, GMQS TDRs, the performance standards, not to be confused with performance incentives, um, the redevelopment tool, administrative incentives, mitigation, impact fees, policies, special events, and STR. So these are the tools we're going to be evaluating. They're kind of the big topics that, that you all identified. But we want to pause here before we get to our eventual dotting of these tools. And as you've been thinking about all these tools, are, are there any that are missing? Are anything listed here that doesn't quite fit that you all want to comment on before we, we get too far down the road? And, and Michael and Mona, I'll, I'll let you add some color there. I would just let the question stand and, and see if there are our answers and feedback. Just um, water use being one thing, and I'm, it's hard to figure out where does, you know, do we want to delve into that? But if we're delving into energy use, um, you know, being a landscape where I've seen a lot of really wasted water. <laughs> And that's almost the performance incentive, performance standard balance that, that we've all talked about with the, with the chairs that, that Samir Mona and Michael, I don't know if you want to kind of talk through where that fits. In yeah, that. I can yeah. see that fit. It, it is. If you, if you look in the, you know, the, the, the status today, performance standards kind of right in the middle of the changes to apply box, it was landscape and slash outdoor water use. Okay. So, yeah. so we'll just put a little star on that one. So should. What about fire? Two aspects, evacuation and building standards uh, to make a house safer. Uh, where would those fit? And for your, uh, like, like, like for your framing of it, uh, performance standard could, could be a spot. And then, but then I would, you know, let, uh, leave it to some in the room who might be doing this work where that might be. And Cindy, I, I think you probably know these tools better than anyone here, so I'm probably going to be looking in your direction a lot. I know GMQS, kind of the weighted scoring system, could it be incorporated there potentially to, to get, you know, create a scorecard for fire mitigation? Um, 
is the question. That could be one way of doing it. Also, just in our standards in the land use code, um, I think we could look again at wildfire and have a totally different standard based on whatever it is. You know, it's like, um, you know, the location of the size. Right now, we pretty much have adopted the state wildfire standards, but we can certainly add our own. And so performance standards uh, is kind of building an energy code, essentially. So so creating some of that code to, to require fire-wise materials. And the, evalu the evacuation route component of that question, I think it's sort of addressed in some of the scenarios by location and proximity to services. But yeah, I'm curious to me where you see that fitting in. And that's obviously a multi-jurisdictional coordination as well. Yeah, if we talk about the regional component, um, well, maybe we just want to have a safety standard that we look at. Um, Sandy, at this point. could you speak up? We have muffled. I'm so sorry. Um, maybe we want to have a safety standard that we look at um, as part of this. And we don't have to know right now, but it's a great point to bring up about that. The safety aspect of um, our community. Um, let's just let's just put it in there as um, safety, and then we can go from any anywhere from the, we can go building code, land use code, standards, um, growth management scoring system. There's so many ways you can. Yeah. I would love to stay away from the GMPS okay. where we are because it feels like that system is fraught with its own problems. So the, and so, if we put it into performance standards that really start requiring some of these pieces, especially like fire wise, fire wise standard, and then difference to fire mitigation. Excuse me. I'm not sure what you mean about staying away from GMQS because so much of this that we have today talks about changes, potential changes to the GMQS. Right. And so I think rather than um, continuing to put items into the GMQS bucket, if we put it in, in my mind, this is in my mind, if we put it in performance standards, it really starts to take it out of um, maybe a um, sort of that it, that it's, that it could be an add-on or it could be an option. Um, and because what I recall from our conversations is that people don't not build whatever homeowners don't go into GMQS as much, they go into the TBR program more because it does some issue. So rather than layering on more to the GMQS, if we maybe use the bucket of performance standards where maybe they become less optional, more required then that helps us uh, maybe strengthen what we're trying to do rather than kind of put it in, I don't want to say the word that's coming to me is bureaucracy is the GMQS has its own set of bureaucracy. And so the performance standards would give us that opportunity to create maybe fewer options, more requirements, but some that would apply across the board to things that didn't We'll talk about where it lives as part of this process. This is this is just an addition that could be somewhere in here. We don't need to interrogate where now. It's on the list, and I think we should move on. And it's already an item that you go through the building process. So I don't think we can necessarily decide where it sits if we want to change it, but yeah. there's processes that we already go through that are well set up. If we want to amend them, it would be easy because it's already there for both the outcome and the fire departments. Yeah. Um, this is a little bit less tangible, but in answering your question, Miles, what about public awareness as a tool and community education? Because I feel like we can make some recommendations around that, and that could have pretty big impact. As well. That has come up a lot, and, and Cindy, I would defer to you if that's accounted for anywhere here. I think to Michael's point, what we want to do here is not determine where it lives, but are we missing any big buckets right. and categories? And I think that's a very fair question that we may be missing in the end. No, the, I agree. But, but it's it's also in the buffet, right? Like the, the, the mm -hmm. homeowner education, right? This is sort of a, a, a maybe a broader take on that. Um, it's, yeah, so it's it's in some of the scenarios and we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. see that as you go through them, right? We will, we will. And, and in terms of a tool, 
um, before we dot, let's revisit it to see if it's accounted for in the scenarios. And that's why we've we've made a couple extra spaces here. So maybe public outreach does um, elevate up into to something that's a really, really good thought. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> we've, we've talked about this, but I don't see it on the list, and that's traffic. Mm -hmm. um, so now when we talk about intensity of activity, <laughs> and traffic has a lot, has, has always come right back, back to that. Uh, and do you, how, how do you, how do you work on that? How do you approach that? Is this a, a way in which we can approach it? So I think it's that that's that's less a tool than than an outcome measure. Yeah. Right? And and so like on, on this colored sheet, you'll see that there are a couple of columns. There's there's the greenhouse gas uh, framing on transportation, and that like this kind of scoring matrix, which we're going to use to to measure the effectiveness of this stuff. But it, it it'll be taken account in there. And then workforce too, because those vehicles are are moving people to and from right. job sites. So it'll it'll be accounted for there soon. Um, to that end, should we specify what we mean by transportation a little bit more? Because I mean it sounds like you're basically saying this is DMT, like the activity impact from trans, you know, like transportation mm -hmm. kind of is like the net of how people get around. So, so we just just want to stay focused on the the thing we're trying to get through right now, yeah. which is the list of tools. So, uh, if we are comfortable with the list of, of tools, yeah, um, and we feel like so, I've got public outreach as a that is a potential tool on my added to my list that we can sort of as we go through them look and see if it feels like it's being met, and if not, how we might get to it. Um, but does anyone want to add any more? Schools to the list of tools. Right. Just one uh, potentially infrastructure, just generally. Mm -hmm. It includes, you know, traffic, water, heat yes. plants, you know, uh, human infrastructure, support systems. If they're not existing in the case of like childcare, then expansion of, like, you know, or using the road kind of to have to be, that has to be taken into consideration. And I agree with. Sierra's point. So that's a uh, huge. And that seems to be what's coming back up through the community, going on up to the surface there all the time. It's holy cow, you know, where we headed. I don't mean to you know, and a lot of that's been attached to some negativity, but I think it's a real, real problem. And it's measurable with you know, some things like how much water do we have? Um, what's our capacity to plant? You know, uh, where, where are we going with our Mass transit and um, down Valley, I think Down Valley is further impacted by that. Some of those things that we post on here. So that like sort of the yeah. infrastructure considerations, you like like how we plan and think about infrastructure as a on the list, you know. Yeah. Yes. And I think some of these, it's a good example of how they're going to start to triangulate into some of the scenarios as well and and, uh, and how infrastructure relates to, you know, zoning and proximity to services and, and things like that. And, and to Michael's point, I think what we want to do for the purposes of this discussion is make sure we're all on the same page. These are the big tools, how, how we use them, how far we turn the dials is going to determine how effective we are and, and what we want more of, what we want less of going back to that exercise, you know, less traffic, less congestion, that's back to the impacts. And we're gonna get there, but right now we wanna make sure that we do a thorough assessment of all the tools so that we're not leaving anything out. And it sounds like um, we've got a couple ads to the list, public education infrastructure, and we'll revisit this before we dot as well. And then if you're feeling like you don't have a lot to add, that's okay, because this is a distillation of the conversations we've had up to now. So we should have managed to get it pretty right. And it sounds like we did with a couple of great additions. And and so, yeah, yeah. moving on. Go ahead. One word I've heard used a lot in these meetings is exemptions. And it's usually, usually has to do with, could we have fewer exemptions? Mm -hmm. Where on that, I, I know they were treated in GM2S, but where, where, is that a tool? No. Yeah, I mean, exemptions are a tool, but um, 
Yeah, I mean, there definitely are. It's just how granular we want to get with all this. I think the tools that we've studied, uh, excuse me, the exemptions we've studied so far have dealt with the uh, growth management exemption. Mm -hmm. So I would say, yeah, let's just keep them under there for now. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a great point. And, yeah, and Christy, I want to um, make sure we hear from you. And we've got you on screen. Hopefully you can hear us. Oh, um, this is not an additional tool. Uh, could you please email me the handouts that everybody has at their table so I can print them out here at home? Yeah, ab absolutely. And and Christy and, and Forrest, um, they are largely what's in the packet. We'll email them to you as PDF so you can be using them as... as uh, oh. Yeah, I have the whole packet printed out, but it sounded like there were special... Anyway, go on. Okay. Okay. All right. So, so the initial draft scenarios, this is putting the tools to work. So taking all of our, our piece, our kit of parts, building them into to five different scenarios that are starting points. Each one of these scenarios could have a million different variations. So this is a first cut at just beginning to determine how these things could all fit together based on the feedback we've got from, from the group. And so Michael and Mona or Kara and Cindy, any other framing you'd like to, to do? Well, that, 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 that's, that's this sheet. So the, the, the far left-hand column is where you'll see the snakes. Do you want to walk through? Yeah. Uh, Karen, Cindy, any other framing that you want to do before we dive straight in? All right. Can so we, Can we mark on these? Uh, please do. Yeah. They're yours to, to mark up as much as possible. That's, that's what, what they're here for. So scenario one. All effective scenario modeling should start with a baseline and no change existing conditions or alternatives. So that's what this one is. If no changes were made to underlying zoning, um, no change to square foot caps, GMQS, TDRs, anything else like that, um, this scenario would be a baseline of how all the options come together. It's where we're headed now if nothing changes. And after each one of these, I'm going to pause for, for Karen and Cindy, who really helped us be the architects of these, to add any, any color that I may have missed. This one's pretty straightforward. Does anybody have any questions about them? Okay. All right. And we'll we'll cook through them pretty quickly and then have some some good QA and, and get to dotting. I'm, I'm, I don't want to rush the conversation, but I, I know I'm cognizant of you all saying let's not wait to do important dotting and discussion until the end of the meeting. So we're trying to get through this this pretty quickly in high-level summation. So scenario two, this is the sample selections from a comprehensive list. So if we largely kept our, our zoning and, and a lot of those conditions the same, but we turned the dials in different ways, think of this as kind of the buffet option, given kind of the existing conditions, how things are working today. If we just turn the dials in different ways, um, this sample scenario in your packet, for example, builds out a floor area ratio concept, and it's stacked with components and positions um, of different dials that could be adjusted up or down and, and uh, could even be excluding certain dials. So um, this is kind of, working within the current framework, but, but just adjusting the dials. Conversely, scenario three, four, and five are more substantial changes that um, would really serve as more building blocks of reconfiguring the entire system. For example, scenario three, the land use code changes within parameters of current zoning. It doesn't change the under, underlying zoning, but it does look at how applying different tools could meet the community's the committee's shared values and goals. So for example, any number of components, any number of tools in this scenario could be stacked together um, and to really create your, your kind of custom customized buffet outside of, of the existing conditions, kind of wiping the slate clean. And and Cindy and Kara, I don't I don't know if I I've oversimplified that or or if you have anything to add. Yeah, it's one quick one. Um, we talked a lot about low hanging fruit mm -hmm. initially. Then, as the I look at this degree of difficulty to achieve before five goes up, so maybe there's a way to really target later on as the process goes forward just some stuff that is easy oh, oh. accepted by the community. And you know, then the entanglements that come with number five or whatever just can be worked through over the next. Whatever time frame it takes, my experience is the harder it is, the longer it sticks around. And Rick, I think that's a great example of 
all of these scenarios, and, and as I said, can have so many different variations. But I think as we refine and adjust them, factoring in like, how can we build a scenario that that starts with low hanging fruit, you know, and, and and integrates that concept into whichever ultimate you know scenario or Frankenstein hybrid scenario emerges. Um, so I think that that low hanging fruit, I would say, is probably something because it is low hanging fruit by definition. It should be included in any scenario we pursue. And we, you know, if you click through to the bigger version of this chart in the packet, you can see that it has that it's there, there are more rows and, and columns. And one that I don't know if it's in the, the, the version online or not, but uh, you don't necessarily need to go to it. But we added within the sort of the output columns kind of to measure the, the effectiveness, a, a degree of complexity mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of score. So I think that. Your point is is well made, and that just just I think reiterates that that belongs as a as a scoring criteria. When did this packet go out? I never saw it. I got two dates emails about dates, and saw no packet. Friday, Friday. last Friday, last Friday, yeah, last Friday afternoon. From whom? They came from Mavis. 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 Yeah. Uh, hmm. Would you do you have a I could look on my phone to see that it's actually there. It could have gone to junk. It could have. <laughs> and so getting back into the, the scenarios and, and uh, this fourth scenario, the sliding scale zoning based on lot size and floor area ratio, this was based on a concept that um, Glenn, I believe you and Randy introduced at the end of, of uh, one of our, our last meetings, the, the kind of FAR concept. So um, this was one, I think Kara um, applies the AR2 bar sliding scale to all rural zone districts that do not already have it. Um, it's purely based on lot size. It does not directly reflect the kind of rural character factors and quality of life considerations as how size and intensity may increase the larger the lot. Um, so this was trying to capture that concept, but again, there's a million ways that 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 could could be interpreted and involved. So I'm curious if, if you guys feel like this accurately kind of sums up at a very high level what you love it. Yeah. Would you guys mind summarizing what it was? It was brilliant. I don't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> so it's a pretty simple concept. I mean, it, the first paragraph sort of sums it. Um, so AR10, RS20, and RS30 currently have no, there's no floor area ratio. There's no sliding scale floor area tied to anything. They're just 15,000 square feet is what's permissible in those three zone districts. <laughs> AR10, and what were the other two? RS20 and RS30. And like other zone districts, I mean, you're not guaranteed to get 15,000, you have 5750, you still have to get TDRs above 5750 to implement that 15,000. And so the idea was to take the AR2 zone district, which is based, AR2 stands for basically two acre minimum lot size. And there are lots of properties in the county that are substandard in size for those zone districts. There's, where we live is a perfect example. We're zoned AR10. That's 10 acre minimum lot size. All the lots in our little area where we live are two, two and a half acres. So the idea was let's apply the AR2 sliding scale for calculating floor area to all the zone districts so that that 15,000 square feet now becomes much more difficult to, to achieve. I can't remember what, what you needed to have for size. It's like 25 or 30 acres or something like that. And of course, the potential for the group is to have these calculations butt up against a new maximum house size. So it might cap out at 20 acres if the size was 12,000 square feet or whatever. So, everybody get that? Uh, just with in this same. Uh thing on sample two, um, it looks like someone kind of took a stab at uh, reducing these house sizes under the square foot path, the very first line of uh, scenario two. Um, 
one acre being would, uh, you know, you'd be able to build a 4920 house, one to two acres, 73 and 65. Um, that where, is applying where those that, numbers come from. That's applying those metrics. Okay, so you just, you just look at the look at the data in the table and you apply it. Okay, um, all right. So that's what that is. That's what would be if yeah. the maximum size in this scenario was ten seven fifty. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. The the only difference is that the the table um, caps out at. Um, Lots that are 100,000 square feet or bigger, so basically a little more than a couple acres. Because remember, this is based on two acre zoning, right? And so, I mean, I just made up an extra category and and that seemed reasonable, and that was adding, um, for over lots that were over 200,000 square feet, right? So, kind of five, five acres ish. Um, you would get um, 0.5 feet for every hundred over 9,000 square feet. So it fits into the to the table. It it, right. it felt reasonable, but I just made that out. Right. And Kara's got her hand up. She was really the, instrumental in being the architect. We can go to gallery view. Um, Kara. Uh, hi everyone. Sorry I can't be there. COVID got me finally. So. Um, but I was not instrumental. This was uh, Randy and uh, Glenn's analysis, but I also want to give them credit of they are not just making it up. We ran the sliding scale. Uh, and I just realized in the memo, I apologize. A comparison between the AR2 and the revised did not make it to the final memo. So that's probably why you have some confusion. So I want to apologize for that. But Essentially, the difference between scenario four, which is applying the AR2 all the way out, versus scenario two um, is, as Randy said, at that five acre, it's dialed back a little bit more. Um, and so you have less floor area ratio in scenario two as the acres get bigger than if you applied the AR2 all the way through. Um, and it's a minimal, but we can share kind of those comparisons. And I can work with Miles when you guys are doing the exercise. So you have that comparison in your meeting. But that's really where um, scenario four is the AR2, as Randy had suggested at the end of the last meeting. And then as we were talking during the, um, the holidays, he kind of revised it down a little bit, recognizing as the acres got bigger, maybe that same sliding scale needs to be ratcheted down a little bit. So that's the difference between the two. Thanks, Karen and Glenn. Oh, you know, well, when we threw this idea out, it was just we used AR2 because it's in the code already. And it would just be easy to take a look at it and see what should be the maximum house sizes if you use that. That's not to say it's right, but that's what's already in the code. And uh, it's just uh, a good starting point for the discussion. May I ask a question, Glenn? Glenn and Randy. Um, I noticed in, in as we were talking about number four, well, I guess it was this. How, do, how does your scenario um, deal with, help us with the climate change issues? It's all about reducing house size. Yeah. It, it, I mean, in effect, that's sort of been the starting point for the group, right? I mean, house size is the biggest box to check. Mm -hmm. And didn't you have a number of that uh, maximum allowable or with the 60% that was up, how much you would cut out if we did the scenario? Didn't you mention it? We thought that would, it was a big number that would engage. Yeah, I think that was a number that Cindy was going to try to research, right? Oh. And, and I don't know. If, if if she was able to to put that together, but you know, there's there's no question it's a significant impact if if we apply this. Um, you know, to Glenn's point, we're not sure if it's right, but AR2 is already in the code. This is a pretty easy step to implement this, and it's pretty significant. Um, you know, for example, I mean, the, what 
Carol was saying is that we did a comparison thing and where it really starts to make a difference is over 10 acres. Um, so for, for now, um, if you apply the new metric, it, it's basically um, 11,350 square feet versus 10,178. So that's 1,200 square feet on 10 acres. On 15 acres, it's, it's over 2,000 feet difference if you apply the sliding scale. So it's pretty significant. Um, so, anyway. And just to add in, we don't have the total square footage numbers, but um, we do know roughly 2,000 parcels of about, I'm gonna rough estimate, 32, 3,300 that are not subdivided. 2,000 of those are non-conforming to their existing zone district. So we don't know the magnitude, but it, we're, the FAR would apply to those 2,000 um, parcels. So that starts to show, to Randy's point, the impact that this would likely have. And, and if you look at your, your chart, um, we'll start to, in, in the blue columns, these square footage numbers, the work is being done to actually get to the answer, the specific numerical answer of you know, what, what this, how, how they stack up against each other, which one moves the, is the, the build out needle more than it is nuts. Or coming, can I say optimistically, right? <laughs> yes, um, yeah, I think the input we get tonight will help us adjust. Mean that that's scenario two to four with this, with this. Um, so on that first AR2 scenario scale, four. You know, just four with all of them. With all of them, that that square footage number will be filled in in that first first column, so that you can see how they affect the needle on the you know, how many more square feet are built based on the different scenarios. And that's the reason for the input exercise tonight is to, to begin to understand you know what is the the committee interested in and in knowing more about and if there's no interest in one of the scenarios then you know it'll help us begin to narrow our, our focus and then we can bring back all of the data based on preferences for scenarios prioritization of, of the tools and how we use them so yeah morgan just to clarify in this scenario the larger square footage is when you get up to the 7300 and 9000 those we're still using 5750 as the maximum before you need to use exemptions and gmqs and we're going to clarify you're talking about scenario four scenario two oh or scenario just any two. of the yeah. scenarios on your to go over 5750 you're still carrie you're nodding your head yes yes that is the underlying assumption and great clarification one of the things we'll talk about is how much harder does it get like can you and if so how much harder yeah and that's a great example of how the the scenarios and the tools need to work together so suzanne and if you could speak up you're a little far from the microphone for our virtual oh, of course um randy and glenn i think that if scenario number four says that it um, well, under scenario two, does it say that it does not deal with character or quality of life issues, house size, although you all are saying it does deal with house size, and that's, that's the main premise of it, uh, and does it deal with intensity of use? I'm just looking at the differences between two and four. Define intensity of use. Um, all the things that we've been talking about in terms of traffic and larger homes and needing more people there to take care of them. And, and if if many of these are going to end up being in the rural areas, are we harming the rural character? So I think, I mean, the right answer to that is, is yes, it addresses that. Mm -hmm. simply because the house sizes are smaller under this proposal mm -hmm. than would otherwise be permitted. And so you could argue that that would be less intensity. I can see. Yeah. And, and, and Suzanne, the, the, if you look at this, this chart, you'll see that on the outcomes, 
uh, the second to last column is, is rural preservation. And the last one is shared values reflected, which is you know, the, all the things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. So while there are there's a similar kind of big lever tool used in two and four, two has a lot more in it. Like, like if you look in the packet, it's the full buffet and, and every one of those dials has been adjusted. Scenario two or scenario four really is only is, is sort of just just leading and capturing the, the FAR approach. So okay. yes. so in some ways two is is four plus. Mm -hmm. Does that be a way to say it? Yeah. Okay. And Suzanne, there's a it's posted on the wall right on your left. Okay. Okay. You. So you can... I've marked a all of my copies at home and then I brought everything except <laughs> well, so you could just and, and for the purposes of this discussion, what staff has done is is just take the taking the scenario purely based on lots lot size and not editorialized at all. It'll be up to the committee to determine those intensity, quality of life considerations for for all the scenarios. And conversely, scenario five, instead of looking at based on a floor area ratio, it's square footage caps based on location, services, and proximity to ur urban areas. Um, so this scenario uses the same logic as the TDA overlay, TDR, excuse me, overlay. The closer to urban areas and services, i.e., water, sewer, roads, the larger the maximum square footage permitted, and the the further away, the more rural the location, the smaller the home size. So basically, it's clustering development in areas that are already developed near the UGP. So that it's a uh, it's based based on proximity to service. So this becomes a spectrum of larger homes near urban cores. To smaller in rural and remote areas. Um, those areas are defined based on the categorization of roads and access to services. It takes into account rural character and quality of life, but not the qualities of the individual lot based on zoning. So it's a, a similar kind of concept to square footage by location instead of by floor area ratio. If that makes sense. I think it does it gives a great assist to redevelopment of the existing subdivisions. Gives the greatest what? It gives a great assist to redevelopment of existing structure in subdivisions. Because we're seeing expansion in those subdivisions as opposed to redevelopment that's compatible with what may already be there. The West End, Cemetery Lane, Brush Creek, wherever you want to look. And that, that I think is the key to the case in a lot of these areas is, is the, the demos that we talk about, the trash that goes to the landfill, all that stuff would be mitigated significantly if there was some overlay on some of these non-conforming areas that work. And I think it's a great, it's not a, I don't think it impacts the economy of construction or real estate transactions or any of that. I think it's still, it just keeps everything a little more balanced. I feel like this goes back to that that rings idea that you shared several meetings ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's a, a great example of the discussion we we want to facilitate, you know, to kind of editorialize on how all of the, the scenarios and the, the tools fit together. Joe, do you have a, a clarifying question on this one? Yeah, would, would scenario five be uh, where we would be able to take into account the visibility of the building site? Um, is that where you would envision that would happen? Or? Cindy, I'm going to come to you if I can. Joe, I think you could take visibility as a performance standard in any of the scenarios, quite frankly. Um, I think the difference between scenario five and two and four are that one is based on the appropriateness of a house size to a lot size. And five has to do with where you're located in general. Are you located closer to the services are you located um, closer? We were talking about fire. How far are you from uh, emergency services? That kind of thing in terms of your square footage. Um, and then when you get way out into the hinterlands, um, I'm thinking about the private properties at the heads of some of our very woods. They would have less square footage. So basically, we put the map up here. We did put it in your packet, but here, the darker the color, the more square footage you have. So the, the more outlying areas um, are the areas that have less square footage. As you go in to the um, little bit deeper purple, um, then you know, get more square footage. And we didn't put a square footage on it because we wanted you guys to talk about that. 
But if you think about rural and remote being 1,000 square feet, you kind of use that as a bookend. And you can just kind of think of, okay, well, in town, or not in town, but right in the urban dark boundary area, is that appropriate for 15? You know, you, you start thinking of those as your bookends a little bit. Um, and then we can get really specific because uh, we work with GIS. We know exactly where all the road service levels change from dirt, pavement, to rougher roads, that kind of thing. Um, and so we, we can get really specific, but that's just the context that we wanted to give you as another bookend to the another tool on um, the zone. That's not something that's currently in play. No. I think about Barbara in on one of the first meetings saying, how did a 15,000 square foot house get right. built or 18,000 up at the very headwaters of West Oak Street, you know? And... <laughs> 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 for a while, I wasn't going to be passing out this just to get Joe's question and where this stuff can live. So, just going back to the cat packet, I know you can't see that for this from here, but this is the paragraph about scenario five. And then the component tool column is here. GMQS and performance standards are, are in there. And a note that I can make that you just said is, you know, does this visibility, where does visibility live in oh, where and, and so that could we take that in the Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that that's that's a dial and 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 Cindy's giving me a couple of locations where it can exist. And so we're 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 doing what we're setting out to do. Um yeah. Yeah. Going. I think that's a perfect transition into building out our, our list of tools before we got them. I know um, we talked about adding public outreach and adding infrastructure um, and for the group to discuss, do performance standards account for visual impacts or is that a separate tool? Or is it or GMQS? It's a tool in the code. I mean, you know, visual impact is definitely a tool in the code. We could we could add it in the list of tools if we want to. So does, does, it it live, does, it, does it belong on its own or does it live in an existing tool? It's, it's on its own. Okay. Yeah, so add it. Oh, visual impacts is an ad, ad here. Yeah. 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 Could add it could be coming on its own tool with a broader array of mm -hmm. criteria within it. It's not performance based, or other, whether it's aesthetic or other types of impact, not just a more performance. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So before, before so you for, for first time. had that one thought on the architecture tool. Oh, well, no. Oh, well, yeah, it's, it's on the tool. Is this going to the. Yeah. So I just, when I was driving up with the kids to hockey and such, I was on the phone, but I wasn't sure if the transit oriented development would fall into zoning or if that would be its own. I'm going to look. Yeah. We talked a lot about that. <laughs> yeah. And we felt like none of these scenarios preclude us from getting to that discussion about growth areas. Yeah. And we wanted to make sure that, I'm not sure if anybody would have, we started off to say it, you know, but I'm not sure where that ended up. Yeah. We're not ignoring that discussion in any of these. And um, if you will, scenario five um, kind of follows that one. It, it, it does. The concern I have with, with scenario five, with in particular to the house size discussion, is I don't think that that really helps to mitigate what a lot of the concern that I hear from the board is with the traffic, the intensity, and the resource use of the larger home, just because they're centralized into these closer to services areas. It's, it's still it actually will further emphasize a very common problem of traffic intensity and and the service required to keep these houses alive and for the most part with the exception of the one uh <laughs> that max is building apparently uh, <laughs> most of them are like basically within the service area i mean some of them have stretched out there's there's a minority that have stretched into the rural but most of the giant houses are here and i think that that's our by here i mean close to the city right and then in the annexed areas and so those are what are driving the traffic and all of this descent, I feel like. 
So I think, I think they're. Am I in accurate with that? Where are they standing there? Are they? Yeah, so I wouldn't. Yeah. And I think this is a good example of what we want to discuss that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. And I think, again, just just to, to, to Forrest's point, I think he, he, he what he's saying is that Outside. scenario five it needs to have more of the dials dusted to, to get to where we want to go. I think. And, and, and so I, mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but as, as like a as a macro idea, you could only accept it if 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 there if other dials were adjusted. I think so. Like yeah. But we don't have to have every single item, right? We don't, that's the whole idea. It's we we can zero in on two or three scenarios that we prefer with the dials and the tools in them. So we don't have to have like if we feel like scenario five is not one that really feels like it's palatable or or the direction we want to go, that through our process that may be discarded. And, 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 but I think it's important to know that you can do adjustments. So scenario five is is really a locational approach, right? Yeah. And and uh, and then if if you like that as your starting point, and you can adjust it to 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 work to get the things that are important to you, then that's that's what we're talking about doing. So don't don't throw, don't throw things out because they're imperfect now, because most of them. All of their tools have TDDs as as their sort of dial location. So, um, you know, and I think that's a, a perfect segue into the exercise we're going to do. And, and how we're not picking a scenario tonight. We're simply rank order prioritizing some of those scenarios. And I think for us, your comment illustrates how important it is to look at the scenarios and the scenario components together. So if you say, well, I'm interested in this scenario, but it would require me to prioritize some tools in a specific way. That's why we're going to do kind of the one step, two step exercise where we're going to rank order our top three scenarios just as a starting point. And then we're going to adopt our top six tools to begin to see how can we adjust some of these scenarios and then begin to start look at their efficacy as we move forward. So um, before we do that, we want to make sure that we've got a comprehensive list of tools. We added visual impacts. We're going to add public education, yeah. public outreach, and, and infrastructure, pending confirmation to me. Yeah. Can I just ask a clarifying question? What's the rationale for? This method, at scenario five, in terms of, um, yeah, prioritizing square footage based on urban growth, being an urban growth country. There's tons of thinking behind it. If you go back to um, that one graphic that we had, where the philosophy of zoning, you know, the more intensity as you um, come closer to the urban services thinking that your services are there there's probably more centralized transportation that would bring people to that area to help serve them. there's probably um something like why city why living in a city is more sustainable you better assume it's more exactly thank you and, and, and also the thing that we have heard you say is the characters and you. and then we heard obviously the safety of life, you know in terms of the services all of those things um so we just use the standards that we already have with uh, road um, classifications, emergency service, and um, uh, more of the character boundaries relative to the um, potential of the water national forest. So thank you. We can ask one of the tool on that. Is there like any, um, I guess, possibility that UGB lot sizes somehow naturally limit the size of homes that can be built there. So are there like few UGB lots that are sized that would accommodate large homes versus like more rural lots? Well, as we know, you have FAR, you have to work area ratios within the urban zone districts. Mm -hmm. But um, just knowing what we know, there happen to be a couple of large lots within the urban growth boundary. Sure. Um, you know, 30,000 square foot, almost one acre lots in Red Mountain. Yeah, so you can get a pretty nice size pass right there. Um, and then there's other pockets within the urban growth boundary. So 
you know, there's all different methodologies to look at that. You're just going to get it limiting um, that, like in the, we were worried about it in Redstone at one point where people were consolidating lots mm -hmm. along the boulevard, and that would take away the character of the small houses in Redstone because of the poor area ratios. So um, we put a limitation um, with the community of Redstone on um, um, separating those lots. I mean, excuse me, on merging those lots. So, things like that. Uh, I was just remembering early on, Glenn commented on the intensity question. Uh, why can't the city and county get themselves together and when things are done? And um, looking at, at intensity in terms of pacing, it, is, is pacing only um, regulated if you are, if you go into growth management? Or do any of these other do any of these other scenarios include the two pacing? To do you together. Yeah, I was just going to say potentially the incentives do that. Um, in terms of pacing, if you incentivize smaller homes, or you could do pacing as part of, um, you know, just an administrative work. You could say, hey, like the city just said, we're only allowing six demos a year, I think. That kind of thing, that's pacing. Mm -hmm. um, so there are probably kinds of ways you can do that. Does does pacing belong to the tool? Um, excuse me, that's right. It's already embedded, if you will, in growth management, but it could be separated out. Yeah, it's a, the, what does the group think? We're we're to the moment where we want to make sure we're not leaving any. So, so much of that depends on the process. You know, we we had projects come through that well, this should take eighteen months, but takes two and a half years mm -hmm. because of whatever. And sometimes people are just like it's your best of rights. So it you know, sounds like build seven years down the road. So it's it's there's a difference in pacing on an organic scale and pacing on an institutional driven by policy scale and incentives. And I think that's what we're really looking for is more of an organic you know, and then if it, if it truly is a great project, then it should. You know, we have a community serving zone district that it fail. And, you, you know, and we so, just couldn't get a community consensus on what that really was. It sounds so it's paces. That's a tough one. It sounds to me like it could exist in a couple of places, but administrative incentives really is, is pretty well accounted for there. And it's currently on this this chart, it's it's the second bullet under changes to apply within the G GMQS comp, which is develop a system that actually does pace development at any one time less than last week. Yeah, yeah. Morgan, one quick comment on the, I mean, we'll probably do it later, but just on the administrative incentives, it seems reasonable that uh, house size smaller than 5750, maybe something in the 3,000 square foot range would be something that would be prioritized because 5750 is the max. So saying you're going to prioritize something that's the maximum doesn't make sense. In my head. But if it was, if you're trying to incentivize, you know, someone goes in and they say, I want to, Redevelop, um, uh, you know, this home from 1970, and you have a streamlined process where because they're not expanding their square footage or going over, is that well, it's a max with that. It's not, yeah, yeah. not, not to nitpick because whether your idea is a good one or not, but 5750 is not, not the max. It's the base. I mean, 5750 is the minimum. And in fact, right, you right. might be permitted 10,000 square feet. And so Okay, I'm permitted 10,000 square feet, but I only want to build 5750. Maybe I should be um, encouraged to do that. I'm kind of trying to think of a way that, and I think we discussed this a little bit, that basically Tim made a great comment that 5750 has become the minimum because people want to fully develop uh, to the maximum allowable right there at that time. Well, without the, getting TDR. I think that the building the building permit uh, process has some pretty organic pacing in what you're talking about, like redeveloping smaller homes. Um, in that, like you have certain levels of building permit that are issued depending on the project requirements and size. So if you're if you're going to go into a three thousand square foot home and you're going to do 
a, a moderate remodel, your permit's going to come out considerably faster than a 10,000 square foot new build in a rural area that requires its own septic development and a driveway and utilities. So the, the per permitting process has a, a lot of play in this pacing and depending on what you're submitting to actually build. That's already existing and, and, and it's it's it varies dramatically from a permit you can get in six to 11 weeks to a permit that's gonna take 18 months. And a lot of that is development size, you know, house size, and the surrounding infrastructure that's required to support that development. And I think this is a perfect example of the conversation we want to have after we got and kind of see where the, the group consensus and commonalities emerge, um, get into what would your own ideal scenario include and why? And that's that's the territory we're, we're wandering into now. So um, I know I've given the, the trailer of what our dotting is going to look like, but Mona and Michael, I don't, if you want to help set it up, I don't know if there's any um, guidance you want to give the group before we break the dots out. Fuels are here. Fuels are here. Scenarios are here. Right. So we have six dots, and those go to the tools. Oh, yeah, and I can describe the mechanics of it. Yeah. I was wondering if you had any editorial words of wisdom, guidance, <laughs> yeah. things like that. I can I can handle the mini yeah. gritty. Okay. So I think I mean this is really an opportunity to sort of flesh out where your head is on how we move towards the goals that we've been talking about and where you feel that we can be making some changes into the county, the land use code and the process that has been used. So this is this is an opportunity to do that and to look at the tools and look at those various scenarios and think and you know when we've talked about these scenarios then four or five is your chance to make some of those adjustments. The red dots for the black and white and then the green dots are for the color chips. Yeah, yes. so what we're going to do here, our recommended approach is to yeah. start with your scenarios and pick your podium, pick your top three. That, those are your green dots, one through three. Rank your scenarios. There's five of them. Pick your, your top three here. And then based on the scenarios you prefer, for us, when we were going through the exercise, it was really helpful to then understand after we, we kind of said, what, what scenarios are we most interested in? What tools then would re be required to refine those scenarios and adjust them? And so that was the approach. And that's where you've got the six to, to just say, you know, order of magnitude, what are your top six here? We've got visual impacts, public education, and infrastructure added to, to the ones that, that we discussed already. And this is just order of magnitude, starting to rank order and understand what how what can we, we be doing to refine these based on your input? So that's the intent here. We're not making any final decisions. We're not eliminating or, or choosing scenarios tonight we simply want to know where where's their commonality where's there some common ground think of it as a recipe if we've decided we're making a quality of life and climate saving soup and tonight we just want to know what ingredients should we put with from there we're going to say okay how many ounces of each ingredient do we want to include and then ultimately at what temperature and for how long are we going to so tonight we're just making the list. Uh, the, uh, and, and, and sorry, just just one, just to kind of talk through, like you know, so, sort of how I'm personally thinking about this is, you know, I, there are, there are a lot of things I like about Scenario Five, but I think that sort of its its degree of change on square foot count existing, you know, fifteen thousand over the caucus area is something that I think kind of for Forrest's point where. You're still going to get like you know intensity. It just might not be further afield. So I might say score scenario five as my top scenario, but then place a, a, a high priority dot on square footage cap over here to start to sort of adjust over here for what I think is missing in scenario five. So that they're they're going to inform each other. And really, this is just to tee up our conversation for tonight, too. So, I think we yeah, yeah, we're not. This is we're not going out and buying the food to eat the metaphor to <laughs> We're just talking about you know steak or chicken. Or we're we're going to have to have food next time. If you guys are <laughs> talking about the thing, I brought food. No one had any. I don't think anyone's going to the food. The food metaphor. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> <laughs> this is more um, the 
this and you may be free to start it. So um, when we look at, let's go back to yours. I'm looking at number five. Then I'm seeing, no, let me, let me, a great one Glenn said, look, the issue is on these dynam dynamic cells is are the exemptions. The exemptions live in the um, GMP computer process, correct? So if I vote for maybe something that um, looks uh, like five, but I really want to go to reduce that square footage and and then I put GMQS because I want to change that. Is Are we assuming that when I put a little dot on GMQS, that that is a fluid um, place that means that we can change GMQS? Yes. Yeah, okay. and so, that's a great example. Uh, when you talk about that, I got lost in the food thing. So, um, <laughs> so it's the dial thing. So I, I want to put a dot in GMQS, not because I accept that process, but because I think it has the potential to that's key. Yeah. What do you think? I have no metaphor to do. Yeah, that. and then a way, a way to, to look at that is if you look at this this black and white chart, you look at GMPS and, and you look at the changes to a file yeah. this, okay. it might kind of suggest yeah. what could potentially happen there. You know, what some of the things that are assumed might happen if you got GMPS. Potential. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that is that's why they're numbers. So, Barb, in, in your instance, if you wanted to limit house size and, and nail down exemptions and, and really clamp down on those, you'd probably put a one on house size and a two on GMQS if that was what you had to see. So, it's prioritization. And gotcha. I think we have Nick and then Don, and then we'll stop. Yeah. Going we'll back, check, check on, uh, on, uh, on Chris. Yeah. yeah. No matter the tools, um, this might be part of the mitigation impact fees, but. Um, I'd like to propose breaking affordable housing out of mitigation, just fees, um, but doing something like City of Aspen, where it's a blend of uh, actual credits for stuff that's actually existing, um, or uh, impact fees, and that could be two different dials that could be played with. So what I'm I'm here, Nick, you're proposing affordable housing as its own standalone tool. Affordable housing credits, or and, and then maybe other things within mitigation impact fees. Like maybe that's a broader way of thinking about it. Things that might be uh, made a little more real, other than just mitigation fees, bring, breaking that out as a I don't know, like as, as a subcategory of mitigation. Can I just <laughs> add that? Uh, no, the physical ones that we're. No, I don't have any physical yeah, things. Alex did email me something which I believe I do have. And, up. You know, so, some of what you're saying is our make our our, our note there, there, that, like yeah, okay. mentioned okay. here, but uh, sort of refinement of them right. your point would belong mm -hmm. in this kind of idea as well okay and so real quick does the group want to add affordable housing to our list or would it be kind of it's, 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 right in, it's there. in there yeah okay right. yeah um just clarifying point here i understand scenario five is based on sort of regional ugb i understand the said again john i understand that scenario five is based on UGB and development near near UGB, and I understand the FAR. Um, what I'm a little confused about as we as we go to select our top three priorities based on the tools, could not any one of these scenarios, with the exception of number one, look the same? You could adjust the dial enough to to you know probably create the Frankenstein that that does get there. I think these are designed to, to put some big conceptual buckets out there to understand, you know, where are we interested in learning more and really drilling down to them. But you could you could come up with a, a, a soup to go back to the analogy that they could bring in all these different ingredients and, and bring it, you know, towards the middle. Yeah, that makes it hard for me to vote. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I think I think um, that you know one of one of the things that will help because it's your you're right. It's a great question. Like if you, you could sort of twist all the dials and get the same thing. Um, is that when we sort of start to take measure in more specific ways with this chart, you know, the complexity yeah. score will might be a tiebreaker between two of them. Uh, and again, you know, the degree to which they guarantee, you know, one combination might just result in a bigger square footage build out than another based on, you know, just a, the, the analysis once the FAR is fully analyzed in terms of square footage. But it's, yeah, so but, but just to reiterate, we're not making a very specific decision right now. We're just looking for kind of 
directionality and sort of a sense of what what is feeling right, what goes far enough. Um, but it's a very broad point. We just and each of these scenarios is going to have a million different variations. And, and so to Michael's point, we want to just begin to, to narrow down and, and look at what philosophical approaches are interesting as, as we move into to this next phase and not get to that level of specificity. And Cliff and then Tim. I don't know if you can put them up. I know, like, we're not going to take any more questions. We're going clarifying to it's clarifying it's questions it's only, and then we're going to round table. So Cliff, clarifying. Yeah, that's what you can say it's clarifying. Thank you. So I understand one of these scenarios we got details, something I can understand and grasp. The other four, well, the first one is pretty straightforward too, you know. Right. But the other three have no details, no substance that I can hang my hat on, that I can compare to Glenn and uh, Randy's suggestion. Um, and so I'm having, I don't know how to deal with this, but you know, I have something tangible, and three things that have no scenario that I can understand that differentiate. You've actually just admitted that in a lot of ways they're all the same. Well, they, they could be made the same, mm -hmm. yeah. but they're yeah. fundamentally not. Yeah. yeah, because of the different tools we'll apply later. But I don't really. This is. Very well, I kind of I kind of looked at it this way. Like two was here are some of the ways you can adjust that tool, mm -hmm. and I mean I. I when it was TBD on all the others, I kind of thought, well, two is the example of what could happen. Two could all, any of those other scenarios, three, four, or five, could also have the same things that are in two or some variety of that along the scale, a sliding scale. Um, I don't know if that helps at all, but that's kind of how I looked at it because, yeah, it was, it was hard to look at the ones that just said TBD. Without giving it some kind of meaning. And Michael, did you have yeah. a comment? And, and I think that's where this, this is a starting point to determine the building blocks and, and kind of the direction that, that we're going. And Cliff, I know you didn't get the packet if the span filter ate it. I just we can we can go into to some more detail later. And this is we're not choosing a scenario tonight. We're just looking at how, where do we focus our energy? How can we refine these scenarios to bring more specificity to them? This is the starting point. It's not the end point. And there's that too. So so the, the you know the, the the tools scoring is equally important. Uh, and maybe so. maybe it's going to be more important. I think for both of Cliff and John's points. Can I just tell Cliff what I oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. What, Cliff, what I did is I just used the bold. So on number five, it's simple. I didn't read the, the purpose of five is the proximity to the growth area. The, um, if you read the scenario three, it says that real, the guts of this is the land use code changes. And, you know, so I just didn't get, I didn't read down, I just read the etiology or the basis of it. You know, that helped me clarify in my head. Bold. And the bolder here is cheat sheets on the, the dot exercise too. So I, that's the challenge with this type of exercise. If we overthink it, it it's you know going to have analysis paralysis. I, I think getting out, starting to understand where there's some kind of commonality, where are we interested in, in exploring some of these areas more? And to Michael's point, how we use these tools is going to ultimately be as important, if not more, because that's what's going to really allow us to bring some of these refinements and, and adjust the ultimate scenario. But as a group, we're going to all need to, to talk about. It. So, um, Tim, did you have a clarifying? Well, um, performance standards as a tool, um, it seems like we had this discussion and we put the energy code under the building uh, building code rather than land use. So, to me, I'm not sure it's really relevant here. It's important, but um, we seem to put it in another box earlier which was building code mm -hmm. so, so did you hear that there was snow melt driveway fall on the building code mm -hmm. the but don't they both <laughs> fall under yeah. performance standards yeah wouldn't it yeah. So, so could you ask the question again so mm -hmm. it seems like performance standard is not a tool for us it's a tool for the building code well i would agree that in general that um we don't want to have, we don't want to make that suit. We want to let them make that suit. Yeah. And you 
just want to give the direction to say, yeah, we can see other tighter, more energy efficient buildings or exterior roof or generalize what it is you're trying to get to. And then they'll create what those performance standards really look like. And Tim, I think if you if you look at the the like the potential changes to apply box in that performance standards column, you can see how it gets broader than just energy code. Right. And if I could just add, if you if you adopt, you can adopt it. The building code, it carries a lot of the building codes like electricity and safety, fire, and 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 actually energy code can speak specifically to. Some of the issues that we've been talking about, which is energy consumption and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, whereas some of the other pieces of the government are going to address it a lot. Yeah, Adam, we haven't heard one quickie yet. I see the value of performance standards in the land use piece, especially related to house size, because it may be, I'm not saying it is, but it could be an incentive tool. Higher standards, higher performance, maybe it has some correlation with being able to get the work business. If we're able to meet those standards. So I see it not just being a black and white kind of building code standard, but maybe a set of tool where if you're striving for higher standard performance, energy efficiency, et cetera, maybe that gets you more points and kind of make this up to speak and sort of identifying house size. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we we talked a lot about this about because we we've we heard the make it harder to get bigger, like create incentives, drive innovation to, to do that. So we've talked about we, that we need, in addition to performance standards, performance incentives um, to be that that path to to bigger. Um, and I think Kara had a hand up. We can go to gallery. Maybe Kara's got some one final thought before we start our dotting. I know the committees discussed this before, and I just want to reiterate. Um, remember that building code is still within the purview of this committee's work. So I just want to reiterate that I feel like that's kind of been unclear. And again, with the goals that the board has set, that the building code and recommendations for changes to the building code, the energy code, or the land use code are all within the purview of this committee's work. Yes. Wisdom, Michael, you want to send us off into yeah. a dot land? We should, we should do it. So we want to start with the scenarios and then move over here to the floor. And I mean, we can do it in a couple of years. It's a little tight in here. It's a little tight spot. We're so. going to get out of the way and be careful. There's a little. Uh, I'm going to stand here to navigate. Three scenarios, red dots, rank order, top six of tools, and then we'll discuss. You don't have to do well with it, You don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, I think, yeah, no, that's, no, that's, no ballot stuff. Like, my TR never failed. Remark it. Before we get a hold of them, I Oh, and, and uh, back. Do you want to read it? Yeah, it makes sense to me. So, you guys, just be careful of the repositories. And I'm going to. Um, Oh, and Bill, you might need some fresh dots. Well, if we okay. get the bills, we're, we're going to stop this. Yes, I think. Yeah. Does he need? Oh, yeah. Okay. And uh, just to, and, and the other ones here, just to yeah. put this out, if you're dotting your hand out, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Please, please <laughs> dot. <laughs> so maybe spend a lot of time on those numbering dots if you don't have a lot of them. Yeah. Christy, do you have a question? 
Yeah. Um, yeah, if I want to devote on one of the added tools, of, of course. course, it's not in my my thingy poppy. Yeah. Um, go ahead and drop that into the chat if you're comfortable with it and we'll make sure it's added. Sorry. Okay. All right. Can I just tell you what it is? My, sure. my, my last one is the public education outreach. That's my number six. Otherwise, I have everything here. So I'll just do the five here. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. So bummed I'm not there. That looks like so much fun. Anyway. <laughs> Me too, Christy. <laughs> You're sick and I have a sick dog and no husband, so. Uh, well, hopefully you feel like you're tracking and can participate, but I'm glad you're still able to be on. Oh, no, this is great. I mean, this, I mean, this has been really good. I could hear everything and it's, I really appreciate this, but I really am coming the rest of the time physically. <laughs> and I'm um, Kara and Emma and everybody, I, I need to duck out of here at 530, but um, yeah. interesting discussion for sure. Yeah. Thank you for being on, August. And if you need to yeah. jump off now, um, I'm okay. sure we'll have lots of where we go with this and based on our conversation this morning. Yeah, for sure. No, I look forward to the follow-up. We can sidebar and dig into the meat of it later. So great. Thank you. Yeah, seriously, I'm joking. I'm not Yeah, so I'm not so am i just sent mine in yeah christy did you do you see the link that you click oh yeah no no i just did the whole thing and sent it and okay see. great and then um emma's gonna text it to me and i'll just i'll physically put yours up in the room okay cool thank you yeah <laughs> My, I, I don't have a number six tool because I it's, wasn't on my thing, but it's public education. Yep, I got that. Thank you, Christy. Okay. Just because 
Yeah. Shelby. And Christy, Christy, if you can hear us, I know we've got your dots account for as well. So thank you so much. Hey, Kara, I just sent you a question in chat. Yeah, I was just, I think it depends on what tools some are and depending on the tools, Christy, some may be and some may not. So it depends. How's that? <laughs> I'm thinking so, of the 1800. Oh, yeah. For the purposes of this discussion, we're going to be tabulating all of this, putting it into a spreadsheet and scoring them in, in reverse. So, for example, on the one through threes, a one's going to become a three, a two is going to become a two, a three is going to become a one. So, a high score wins. So, we're going to be doing some of that in the background. But the purposes of the discussion tonight is to really see what trends emerge and why you put your dots where you did and what does your own ideal scenario include? So Michael and Mona, I'll defer to you on, on leading us through that discussion. Yeah, I think that you can kick off that. And if anybody wants to talk about maybe why they chose a particular scenario and why they put their dots where they put them, if you want to talk about that, I think that'd be great. Yeah, or, or as, as, as specific or general as you want to get into it. So, um, um, would anyone like to go first? Is that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good point. So, so three it's, minutes. Yeah, it's, well, yeah, three minutes is, is too, too much. <laughs> well, just, it's one quick thing is that I have an idea that um, Scenario 2 might have done really well just because it was fully built out. Yeah. And so it easier for us to kind of look and see what all these changes were. And I like a lot of the changes that were built up in scenario two, uh, but there was some of the things in the other scenarios that maybe were more important to me, Yeah. but scenario two kept coming back 
as a, as a really important one for me because there were so many things built out in scenario two. So the study could be a little skewed. But it was yeah, what were the things that you liked and some of the others? And, and some of the others, well, um, one, I like the the lowest house size cap yeah. listed on anything, yeah. you know, the scenario three, I think. But it didn't include a lot of the stuff that was in scenario two that I liked. Yeah. You know, so it was just trying to balance it all. Yeah. At a certain point, like I said, it's not, we're not making a decision until we're just talking about that. Hmm. Hmm. I, I picked um, scenario five as my top only because I think that there's an important aspect to where are urban services and where is there kind of realistic expectation of being able to have water service, sewer service, and that that is a really important framework, I think, in my mind to protecting rural lands and that there should be some kind of feathering out, so to speak, of where is the most intense development versus where is something that is going to be more responsive to the natural land and, and the services that are available. And so that's why I picked scenario five as my first one. And then thinking about the tools, I think you layer in the house side, I think you layer in what is the affordable housing limitation and, and you layer in some of these other things. Um, I really liked the idea that Randy and, and Glenn had, and I would just add to that. I, I think that an idea of slope reduction or its reduction related to what the land has and its characteristics is really important. So if you have a, a parcel of land that is 45% slopes, you shouldn't be able to develop up to 5750. You need to respond to what the land is, is providing you. And so that to me is a really important tool that I would want to see later then as we move forward. Great, great, thank you. So I'll follow up kind of similarly. I, I chose my scenario based on what I thought set the best base map and starting point, and then being able to layer on even pieces of two or four through the tools. I, I wanted to look at where do, where's the right starting point, the most important starting point for me in my thinking. And similar to Jessica, I have the like same sentiments, knowing then there was levers to pull that could achieve some of the aspects of two or four as we layer in where, how do we then govern on a more micro scale would this kind of set down a base map for and then find that right balance in different locations, site pressures, aesthetics like Joe brought up, things like that. You're making me want to change my vote. <laughs> it's not a vote. I, 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 I leaning that way for the reasons you both just described. But I ended up going with two for the reasons that Debbie did, yeah, um, and and uh, that I felt like yeah, it was it was where it represented maybe a little more of where I want to end up, and and but you're you're right that we could end up there with with five too. Mm -hmm. we don't think we should have had more discussion with each of them. Well, we'll, we'll, we, can, we'll we can vote again. Uh, I mean, we like one thing that we've discussed that sort of after this, like let's like after everybody kind of makes their case, let we do it again. Like, you know, couldn't be further from time. It's to have them do to me what they just did. <laughs> <laughs> and to narrow down their options, the one key takeaway for me is doing nothing is not an option, not a single dot. Uh, yeah, I, think, yeah I, I find that very, very illuminating. That's good. Well, that's why we got picked for this committee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if not. No, no. <laughs> Blake's written a letter about, about this. Others have expressed themselves. Forrest and, and Max, you know, kind of from the contracting business. But but there's nothing in the in the first choice to, to do nothing. I think that's I think that's quite revealing. Mm -hmm. It's important. Um, anybody else want to talk about David? Just echo what Jessica Cam said. That, you know, part of what Glenn's and uh, Randy's proposal does is it kind of sets the stage for moving into that number five scenario. Because if we look at what's out there, and you know, the most difficult thing with the UGB is convincing the, the community that density is a good thing and that transit oriented development is the future. Governor Romer was on, not Romer. Uh, <laughs> well, Robert was kicked off the whole discussion on smart growth in the 90s. I still go back to those principles. 
And Polis was on the news last night suggesting that that's the way we have to go. And the state of Colorado is basing a lot of their funding that they're going to be passing out to the communities on this, this model of development that he was talking about. Density, transit oriented, you know, affordable. And uh, for us, you know, where we've created a UGB in the late 90s, the most difficult thing that we've had to do is get development approved within that boundary. It was a nightmare to try to push it through. So political will, if we could base it on something like Randy and, and let him come up with, would be maybe a lot easier. And, and they would be able to have a defense against people that want to develop outside the urban program if it comes from the community. So I, I really think that this is a, this is a breakthrough for the persona to see how this is coming together. Um, and and the, the incentive it seems to be a lot of it is based on just meeting the human beings sort of needs and listening to our community what's going on. And that's reflected in number one, just like Bill said. Mm -hmm. you know, something's got to change. Something's got to do. Yeah. So good. Yeah. Five, four, three. But now I went. And I went with five as number one. And I like the metaphor that Cindy used today, the bookends. The bookends are the UGB and rural and remote. And so for me, protecting the wilderness and the habitat is so critical. And um, I'm not completely convinced about the formula, but I like the notion of a formula that you would apply in terms of uh, my two colleagues, Randy and Glenn. And so I, 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 I'm not totally co committed, committed to it, but I, it, it's got some potential. And, and then I just think uh, it's applying a, a whole lot of different tools and number three was uh, why I picked that one. Thank you. Anybody else? Five, four, three. Yeah. Uh, can I follow up on Jessica's point about slow production? Uh, under the heading, no good deed goes unpunished. I was the one who suggested uh, a meaningful slow production formula. Uh, I did that because there seemed to be a lot of concern among the committee about build out, uh, the build out study. Um, and I, I suggested that a slow production formula could reduce that build out. Um, I have a problem with it, it being applied to limit square footage, which is what staff is suggesting. Uh, there are PUDs out there. I lived in a PUD where we were, we were tested under the current slow production formula. And then we uh, laid out the subdivision preserving pretty large tracts of open space without regard to where the, and, and placing the lots without regard necessarily to where the steep slopes are. So um, it would be a hardship for an existing PUD, for instance, to uh, suddenly have each lot tested under a new FAR or a new slope reduction formula. Maybe one clarifying question related to what Joe's just said. I, I've been under the impression that if you have a site specific approval, like a plan development, that you would be exempt from anything this committee is doing. Is that? Well, that's a question we haven't discussed. Yeah, that's, 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 that's how I've been afraid. Yeah. Um, that's sure. classic. That's the way it typically works. But we do want to talk about redevelopment and what this group wants to see relative to redevelopment. Um, should that stick, uh, or should it always stick to the already are vested and you have your sticks and brick in the ground, um, or should it um, only change if you change? Do you maybe decide to tear your home down, and um, should you have to go to the new formula? Those are all questions that that we have to discuss and. One of the things that we're learning in all the packet data that you've gotten is 
one of the biggest impacts we have is redevelopment. It's not redevelopment, it's redevelopment. And our landfill is all about the impacts from redevelopment and um, all the all the changes we're seeing in square footage, a lot of it's due to redevelopment. Um, and, and the changes in the character somebody mentioned in some of these neighborhoods. So it's a big discussion. Yeah, and, and just, just you know, one of our, our, our goals is actually to hear from everybody as, as, as part of it. And um, I'm going to, therefore, you know, we kind of opened it up just to let it volley around the room. But in, in, the, in the limited time we have left, I want to just go around the room and, and I'm going to start with you, Nick, if that's okay, and just ask you to say something about how you voted as specific as you want, just, just so we hear from everybody in the room, because this was a, a big moment. Rick, I appreciate you saying it was a breakthrough for you. Uh, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask everybody to say a little something. So do you mind? Yeah, um, so for the different plans, um, I like the idea of using existing um, things in the code that can be applied and retooled without coming up with completely new new things or completely rezoning and making major major changes. I think that we can get to where we want with what's there um, and modifying it as needed. Um, the uh, and, that, and I would second the, the idea about the um, overall concept of what the land can support, what the, what the site can support in terms of square footage, but also um, on-site renewables, um, if, if you can't support that, does that go to something where you can mitigate it with the fee to fund some sort of large solar plant somewhere else or something like that? Um, as for the, the tools, I was, um, performance standards is, uh, I think I'd put a, a one on that. Um, and again, I think I've said something similar before, but I, I I think that with all the tools, we should try to use the tools to try to get as much out of um, the desire to or balance out the desire to build larger homes um, uh, and uh, not only re reduce the um, carbon footprint, but also um, try to give back to the community in some fashion, whether that be, well, that's not the form stands, but, but, but maybe mitigation fees for affordable housing. Um, we can see benefits um, coming about from uh, as as people want to try to get larger houses. The um, you get a proportional or an exponential increase in community benefits and exponential reduction in um, impact. I was um, I, this is my bias as a planner. I, I was really affected by how hard it would be to prepare a legislative program to make these um, different scenarios work and what would be politically acceptable. And I ended up um, supporting, I guess, scenario four, um, three, and five. But um, in terms of tools, my bias is to keep it as simple as possible. So I like make zoning number one and uh, growth management and TDRs are right behind it for me uh and then i guess i have a really strong bias towards visual impact so that would be an important tool for me uh because it, 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 in a, especially in a beautiful county like this the the visual aspect it, i just really value it a lot in terms of not seeing stuff even though it might be there i prefer not to see it and then um well, I don't know. I, I always think about the capital facilities, you know, and, and what can be accommodated based upon the, the capital facilities of the community. So I think that's important. And that's what led to my my choices. Thank you. So I'm not sure I may have missed interpreted five because I, I like what Jessica had to say about it but I didn't vote for five um I voted for the other three yeah with you know it, as we sort of talk about the ones that are all TBD two three and four kind of all really sort of feel the same I mean there's some distinctions but they can all be made the same with how we structure them 
Um, to me, it, it, it felt like five was, and we didn't really say this, but it, it, it feels like it's rezoning the whole county. And I don't like that. I don't like the idea. I think that politically it's going to be a nightmare to talk about that. I think it's really going to be difficult to implement. Even though there are some good there are some good things involved in five, I voted against it because that's what it feels like to me. We're just going to rezone the whole freaking county. And I don't like it. Um, in terms of my tools, I'm kind of in the same, the same uh, uh, vein as Glenn. Um, zoning, square footage cap, GMQS, TDRs, but I was one of the two that marked slope reduction. And, and you know, I mean, Jessica Keat on that, it's an incredibly powerful tool. And the way I envision it is subdivisions that are already approved. I mean, they're approved as part of the PP. I mean, I consider those, they would be exempt. So Joe's issue would be a non-issue. I mean, other subdivisions, there's, there's plenty of other subdivisions. But my own personal property would be affected by this. But I still think that it makes sense that if, if and it, you can't use the city formula. I mean, we'd have to really think about how the formula works because the city formula, you know, and I'm making this number up, but 90% of the land in the city is flat. There's very few properties that are really affected by slope reduction in the county. 50%, 75%, I don't know, some huge number potentially could be affected by slope reduction, but it's an incredibly powerful tool. And one that makes sense to me uh, intellectually that for the reasons that Jessica stated, you know, that, that you know, if I've got a, you know, a, a, a five acre site and four acres of it is vertical and I've got one acre that's really usable and, connected, um, I think that my house guys should, should be a function of that one acre and not the whole five acres. But it, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of thought would have to go into how to structure a fair and equitable slope reduction formula. So. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, so you, you quickly went, you wanna add anything to what you said? Well, just on number five, I would say, Randy, that uh, with, Rural and remote already in operation and there, and if you accept that, that that's already got the zoning it needs, and then uh, the urban growth brand, that boundary essentially is is there as well too. So I don't think it would be as radical as you think. But for me, I uh, uh, zoning uh, square footage, GMQS, TDRs, performance standards, and pacing, add in incentives. Great, thank you, Sue. Yeah, I found all the tools to be useful, um, so it's hard to kind of rate them. Um, but my feeling is just that the current growth trends in this valley become so egregious, and it's such a it's the opposite of a reflection of the kind of community and culture that we want to create. So I'm for kind of rezoning the whole county, um, and really, <laughs> whatever scenario is going to have. The greatest impact in terms of uh, mitigating the harm and making this community more resilient. So I, I don't really know which I did five, four, and three, um, but I I'm still I still want to understand which what kind of impact each one of those could create those foundations and then kind of go through the tools on layering them. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah, so for me, um, I, my top was five for the reason Jessica mentioned. Um, second was number two for, I think, the reason Debbie mentioned and Michael reiterated. And then my third was number four um, for reasons that have also been mentioned. I like the concept of a formula. And I'm also really interested. I mean, I almost see four and five as a little bit of the inverse in terms of where large uh, homes would be developed. Um, so I'm really interested as we start like populating these fields with analysis and data, like where net developed square footage in the county, um, kind of like where that balance lies in those different approaches. Um, on tools, um, you know, I prioritized the square footage cap because I think 
ultimately, as we all know, that's the main driver of the things we've been asked to solve for. Um, also prioritize redevelopment for the reasons Cindy mentioned. Um, also chose zoning GMQS and TDR because those seem like really powerful levers. And one that I stayed away from was mitigation um because i really feel strongly about relying on mitigation for things like transportation and ghgs actually nets more activity and more generation of all of those things because you're allowing the big thing and then you're building more stuff to offset it mm -hmm. um so it like it nets more activity um and i think that's one of the things that you know tensions is one thank you um on the scenario two, four, and five, but honestly, I, in the end, I'm hoping it's going to be a blend. I don't see any of those things as being a solution for all the problems we have. And to be more specific, I put number one up over that house cap uh, as far as pools. You know, I like Randy and Glenn's idea, but I would still want a house cap so that the sliding scale doesn't continue to go to 15,000. If it ended at 10, I would be much more supportive of that concept. So to me, um, it's really the devil's in the details for any of those scenarios, which is why I was talking about that earlier. I had trouble weighing the, the four different things. difficulty. In the standard of development of the HF and government's thing to do some work with that, I think it looks like. And uh, there's got to be some conformity in the education pass that says it's like that, but you know, you know, then it's reach, reach, and there's um, come to a conclusion on what it looks like it's going to look like on top and bottom. And that has always been a standard block. The main thing is getting that kind of, uh, and we're now seeing, you know, government projects react to the problems that they're, they're seeing. And the new county is starting to change their mind in a different direction. But I think this conversation is a, a starting point for other things to be considered up and down the road. It's going to be good. You yeah. know, they're, the three legged stool of the airport expansion, uh, I 70, 82 intersection in Glenwood, and now the entrance to Aspen are probably the three biggest impacts that we're going to see in our lifetime. Yeah. Uh, somehow that's got to all flow together. Yeah. I, I'm going to, I, I guess I will I apologize in advance, but I'm, I'm going to try to skew us along, along just a little bit, just because, you know, we've, we've, we're already starting to lose people. And, and then. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Well, I, I went for uh, five, four, and two, not necessarily in that order, but one of the things that bothers me a great deal about number five, the idea of clustering and moving everything towards the urban environment and density, is that we are all up valley, that the city is up valley of everything else that's coming up. So in effect, we're creating and we want to create that intellectually, at least, or pragmatically, I guess, in terms of how land use code people look at it. We're, we are trying to attract all that activity and intensity up to the top of the valley here. Um, so that we say we go with a 10,000 square foot house on Red Mountain, we'll think of all the trucks that are servicing that, that house coming through the center of town. So that's a problem that I have with the clustering argument. Um, and what it does to traffic as a tool, I mean, I think road impact fees is probably a significant tool, uh, penalize the usage, but I think that's a hard one to push through, but um, make it really expensive to go big in, in the urban growth area. Great, thanks. I chose uh, two, three, and four. Um, I'm not sure I fully understood five, but um, you know, my concern with just impacting people's property based on where they live, I, I would just see people kind of up in arms about it. But um, as far as the tools go, I think performance and uh, 
standards is one I ranked highly. I did put administrative incentives in my head. I was just thinking time may be you know the most valuable carrot you could dangle in front of people. And I think something that I think could really, you know, I think to some people time is more valuable than than money and, and if they could build a small home faster. I think that's a valuable carrot that we should all think about. Um, I did put mitigation fees on there. I do think that you could look at square footage like a rent situation where you know snow melt equates to mitigation fees that are then applied to building solar panels and things like that. Potentially, square footage could be dealt with in a similar way. Um, you know, I do also agree with the visual impacts. Uh, I didn't put something there. I think I missed it because it was a marker, but I do think that. Again, snow mass, the DRC evaluates properties really just on the impact to the how they're going to look in around the valley. So I think that's been successful over the years. Um, but yeah, I think there's all sorts of levers that we can talk more about. Just real quick on tools. Um, yeah, square foot cap was my number one, but also I like the zoning idea. And I would like to see that. Um, TDRs not uh, eliminate GMSQ, so or GMQS, that those two somehow get combined, and TDRs, I think, would get through a lot with um, make, uh, making them so they're not so easy to build bigger houses, you know, restrict the use of TDRs by less work with the, all the stuff that's listed here. It's good. Yeah. Biggest thing for me is just whatever solution reduces uh, total square footage in the county by the greatest number. Um, and so going with the square footage cap that leads to two and uh, four, potentially, I don't know how the numbers will turn out with um, Len and Randy's um, thing. But yes, yeah, square footage in the way that GMQS and TER is playing into that. And I just try and think of it as. You know, what if a ski co came to us and like, we're building four new ski areas and 20 new hotels, and it's going to put this many more cars in the We all go crazy. But the same thing is happening with the level of use. And when we start talking about transfer rate and development, et cetera, et cetera, that's meaningless in this new economy of construction and property managers where you have to have people on roads and we're going to be putting them through the same roundabout. It, so, Bringing down square pushes, I mean, um, I like scenario five. Um, I think our zone districts are generally on the right track, so I don't have the concern that Randy has about a need to rezone the county, which is not something I would look forward to. <laughs> uh, on tools, I my main three were zoning, TERs, and GMQS. Um, I'm like Morgan. House size for me is a big one, just with energy use and wastefulness and, um, and character. <clears throat> I feel like it's really changed our character of our valley. And I feel like we're getting hijacked by it a little bit. Um, over here, I, I voted um, 243. And I'm I'm still really conflicted with five. I sort of have this vision in my own head of all the mansions being in one place. And I love the idea of smaller homes and kind of less disturbance in the rural areas. But I also I'm I'm really conflicted because I feel like one of our greatest challenges is that the people that live and work in this town can't live here. And that scenario I don't believe is really gonna help it. I'm not sure. I don't know what the answer is, but um, I'm conflicted on that. Okay. I think in general, like you said, any one of these can turn into any one of the others. So I think it's more of picking one and then going to find which lever to pull and what that lever is going to do. And if you pull one lever in one way, then the other one may not need to be pulled as firmly as the first. So I too went to put two, four, and three. Um, mostly because of the same thing, traffic coming into the valley because of five. We, we can't get people to live here and work here anymore. 
So we're just going to add more trips up and down. And that, I realize it's better for the built environment, but it's probably not better than that. Um, I went with number two first, mostly because same sort of thing. I just felt like that gave me the most leverage to mix and match all the tools because I think what it really comes down to is what tools to use and how to use those. And I felt like that gave me uh, the most um, freedom to mix and match. The one tool that I kind of want to bring up because I know it's probably one of the ones that had it pretty high on my list and not a lot of do is TDRs. And one of the reasons. I don't know if it's really pop on my list, but I think it is partly because I just read through the handouts that we got. And as I read through that, it just really highlighted all that. I was like, this is exactly why this one. I, I think TDRs have gotten really bad rapid. I'm one of the ones who often read in my eyes that, oh, so you just buy your way into square footage, right? You can just take it from one to the other. But we conserved 10,000 acres almost, I think it was, in these rural and remote areas. That's who, Right. I mean, I think we forget because you focus on what we've lost in this valley. But if we think about what we've gained with this TDR system and look at the backcountry, look when you go hiking, when you go anywhere, it's it's unbelievable. So I'm not saying to leave it as is, but I think that could be the most valuable tool because I think we forget, like I say, what benefits we got. 10,000 acres, that's incredible. <laughs> and that's 10,000 acres in those places that we are saying we want to conserve. Um, and also, I think that that TDR policy inherently does a lot of this, right? It brings a lot of that stuff in rural and remote and puts it closer to the UGB without specifically saying that was, I think that was part of the thoughts behind it. And <clears throat> the one thing, and I've said it before, that I think is a huge tool with the TDR though is if we can legally figure out a way to do it, there's way too much money being exchanged hands that we're not taking any of. And like I've said before, we need capital for a lot of these tools. Let's face it, a lot of these tools are going to cost us money. There's a big hunk of money right there if we keep these TDRs. I don't know the legality of it, but I can't imagine there's not a way for us to profit off of a percentage of those things. Um, secondarily in tools, I still believe, and Debbie mentioned it again, that there's a way to take these TDRs and then say, okay, TDR is just a starting place. It's not an exemption. Then you go through the GMPS. And that would be my way of mitigating square footage. Um, I think it'd be a really good way. And then I think we haven't talked enough about in here the performance standards. And I think we have these, we could easily quickly get into these. But I did have some conversations with some people that I know today. And there's a lot of ways for performance standards to make all of our houses big, little uh, redevelopment meet a lot better standards than we do right now. And, and you know, there's some simple tools already. I actually think we would need to go more than the simple tools of the hers ratings and stuff to incorporate all the outdoor use. Because to me, being a builder, and I, unfortunately, I'm the worst at it because I've done it, but <clears throat> swimming pools and snow melt are hugely the biggest issues with them. Um, with with the greenhouse gases, it's enormous, and I mean we're we're heating the environment with both those. Um, have a, a, a million dollars, but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I I just backward mapped what our purpose is, which was climate goal, um task climate goals, and um, mitigating the impact of growth that is preserving and enhancing the valley. So I did it through that lens because otherwise I get real biased. <laughs> but I, so I, I got a little confused here. I did two, three, and five, but again, I think it could go anywhere, but I wanna reiterate what Morgan said and Jono said, and I feel like I, it's the house size. I and mean, there is no way for us to, um, uh, you know, we have to come back with, how are you gonna meet the climate goals? How are you going to preserve the culture, the rural and remote? Um, and a 10,000 square foot house, you know, flies in the face of that. So I want to choose the tool that is most effective. I don't, I'm keeping our house size at 5,750 square feet with no exemptions. Mm -hmm. And so whatever those tools are, I did the tools, the zoning square footage, jam and QSS and TDRs and the performance standards. What can we do to, to um, meet the charge of their task? Um, 
And I feel like we're spending a lot of time trying to figure out ways to let people have bigger houses. Um, I don't feel that way. I feel like a 5,750 square foot house is fine. And it will not have all the people on the road. It will give preserve our culture. So I didn't preserve our culture. I got the point. But so I chose the tools that would get us there. You good with what you say? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Um, and I think uh, as far as the scenarios, I really think it's the tools that kind of drive any of the scenarios you pick. And um, so I was kind of a little more focused on the tools. I, the square footage shop's really high because I just don't think that in today's world, there's enough resources for any one person or family to consume that many. And that they're, they're, yeah, the, the change has to start somewhere. And so we tend to lead the region, we tend to lead the state. So we need to set an example that like one person that wants to live in a beautiful environment like this can't just come in and consume the resources that a hundred other people would consume. And, the, and, and then the, the, the studies that came out on the exponential use were pretty shocking, uh, even worse than I would have anticipated. I went with zoning and redevelopment kind of as 2A and 2B because redevelopment is the future of what development's going to be here as the as the urban growth boundaries you get built out to their maximum capacity like Telly Ride High, everything in Telly Ride redevelopment. Um, and then I honestly think, you know, if we take care of zoning and square footage, TDRs are going to lose some of their glitter um, because you'll only be able to apply so many until you hit the square footage mark. Mm -hmm. If you go from 15 to nine, Thousand square feet, you've already put the four TDRs off the table for potential use. And so, you know, although they're super important and they do play a great role in conservation, like they're not going to be the shining diamond that they are now once the house size and the zoning and the redevelopment all gets approached because they won't, they won't impact it as much. I actually didn't, I actually didn't even vote anything towards mitigation because my experience with the people that have the the resources to build these type of will pay anything in mitigation because they'll make it up on returning on investment when they sell the property. And 90% of them are, these are investments in the long run and mitigate, you can charge them as much as you want for mitigation and they'll stroke a check for it. Um, yeah, it puts money into the economy, which is great, but what really hurts is the middle-class people who are trying to build the, the home of their dream and they're hit with the mitigation fee that they literally can't afford. And someone who's building 15,000 square feet literally strokes the check for the mitigation and builds a 200 kW solar field that's tied to their house. And that's great that the solar field's there, but like the middle, the middle class person is just taxed and, and they, it's, it's non-consequential to someone who can afford it. That's that Thank you. Uh, well, I think I've changed my mind twice now. <laughs> that's why this is so valuable. I'm actually going to ask a question. We do. Chrissy. Oh, Chrissy, sorry. Oh, um, hey, guys. Um, okay, real quickly, I share some of the concerns about scenario five, and I think that we can make any of the other three scenarios pretty similar because of the mix and match of tools and levers. And so... Um, like Lydia, I started at the back end saying, okay, how can we really impact our, you know, and achieve our climate goals? And I think that the tools with the most muscle are the combination of GMQS with exemptions in it and TDRs. And the most important thing is that we recalibrate the way that people get permits focused on better performance standards, energy efficiency, no matter what the size of the house is, by God, they need to achieve, I think, um, a new HERS of net zero. What what are we fooling around with 34? And, and anyway, so I think that um, climate change is, is the most important thing. I also, I think that the these programs for TDRs and exemptions and GMQS need to coordinate. They all need to have common veins in them. Like for instance, a TDR um, needs to build back to, you know, the the rigorous build to rigorous energy performance standards. They need, need to be forced to um, reuse construction materials. There's so much muscle and those kinds of performance standards and also um, better control of redevelopment. I want to say one more thing, which is 
One thing we haven't talked about <laughs> are the 1,800 houses that do exist that have whatever, they, they don't necessarily meet any energy standards. And what can we do to incentivize the huge current stock of houses in this um, county to also go greener and exert higher efficiency standards? And I think there's there's got to be an incentive program that we could work on, that, and that would be huge. All right, I'll just go really quickly. Um, I went two, three, and four. I don't think I understood five well enough. But to me, two really has a buffet, as we talked about a lot of the a lot of the pieces in it that were really driving where we want to go. I agree with everybody that you could get there with any combination of two, three, and four. I think that the um some of the important pieces are the square footage cap. Again, we've seen the, the trajectory of energy consumption. We're focused on greenhouse gas uh, reduction. How do we get there? <laughs> it's important. It's an imperative. And if Pitkin County is going to be a leader, in my opinion, we need to really achieve the greenhouse gas reduction that we've set out to do. And how size seems to be doing that. It relates to the transportation that comes into town. GMQS and TDRs were high on my list and performance standards. Because to just to echo what everybody, what a lot of people have said is the performance standards can have some muscle to them. We can really go to a net zero, we can go to a herd zero, we can require, we could do some different requirements. And I too am concerned about redevelopment and the existing housing that we have that is inefficient and maybe not operating as well as it could be. So anyway, that's what I was saying. So I was, uh, I went two, five, three. I think I'm actually now comfortable with that again. Uh, <laughs> because, um, you know, Tim and, and John and Jennifer's points about maybe some of the unintended consequences of five are, are something that I really hadn't considered until they said it. So that was a really important point for me. Um, on my on my tools, uh, I went square footage cap for kind of the reasons that, that Morgan and others have explained that look, we gotta we gotta do a hard thing that's gonna move the needle in, in, in the ways that we want. And, and to me, that's one of them. And I, I, I won't go through all of them, but I just wanna say that I, I then I had redevelopment as my number two. I was really surprised by how, how, seeing the numbers, how low it ranked. I, thought I would, as the conversation continued, would be making the case that we, we move that up. And then I'm just gonna ask real quick, who just with a quick show of hands would re-vote in any way, would move their numbers around based on the on what they've heard around the table? Yeah. Okay. Um, so interesting. Uh, good. You're smarter than me, clearly. Um, but uh, anyway, and then uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll let Miles kind of take it to what's next. Sure, sure. Yeah, and if we can go into the the next slide. Um, what we'll do, we're going to run the numbers, just some back of the napkin. Um, we haven't begun to dig into the, the beast that is going to be tools. And, and one thing that did stick out, house size cap clearly has the most ones of any. So we'll, we'll crunch those numbers. And on the scenarios, number two, number four, sort of the highest, five close behind and three behind that. So I think we'll work with the co-chairs to really begin narrowing down, down. I think we heard two and four with the floor area concept are essentially very similar. So maybe there's one scenario that's just an FAR concept. And then there's maybe another, I think I heard a lot of, we need to know more about five and there's a lot of potential unintended consequences there. So we wanna explore that. So staff will work with co-chairs to fine tune the scenarios, bring them back to the next meeting in the packet as we report out, we'll share all the, the raw data here. And this isn't voting, it's just figuring out where we're at, where there's some energy. And uh, we know that there's probably some people who would move their dots now after this discussion. So um, so that's what we're gonna do. And I believe the other question we wanna broach is, clearly two hours is not enough for a lot of these meetings. Um, we, I think as in working with the co-chairs, are thinking about other ways to really make sure that we finish strong here. Um, if we go to the slide after this, or maybe the two forward. This yeah, one? There's a couple ideas to consider here, maybe extending the current meeting times, 
maybe at some point considering a retreat or getting to weekly meetings. Once you're to the point of finalizing your recommendations, wordsmithing, um, that sort of thing. So I don't think we want to make a decision here tonight, Michael and Mona, but just to plant the seed. And I think if tonight's clock is any indication, yeah, Joe. I'm getting a lot of pressure from Ellen to finalize the master plan for Castle Creek. So, you know, I'm not looking on moving up the meetings here. Um, I'd rather go out longer than, than uh, starting to schedule weekly meetings. So, of course, you can hit the bike with her. <laughs> well, we, can, we can, like, kind of like, you know, just send out a poll on this and mm -hmm. see, see who likes what. And, um, but out. the point is, like, we're starting to get to some of the some of the sausage making, and we don't want to say like, oh, you know, like shops closed. We'll see you in two weeks. So um, anyway, so just something to, to to think about. Like, what what do you think would be the most effective way to do it? Do you consider like out of meeting work on the alternating week? Like a committed like half hour responded to my resolution or something. Just another idea. Well, and the momentum that you all made tonight, I, I think we've got a lot of it, and we have five meetings left. So if we need to extend to your point, maybe that's a palatable option. And I like the idea of maybe a full Just move it out till spring. Yeah. I mean, there's no rush. Yeah, yeah. 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 we've got a thank you christy and everyone joining online have a good night bye you too bye thanks christy thanks Emma.